House of Ed Tech, Episode 75. I'm Myers, and we're listening to the House of Ed Tech with my daddy, Chris Nevy. Support for this episode of House of Ed Tech comes from SummerPD.com. Expand your knowledge of Google Classroom and apps, formative assessments, and much more. They offer 10 courses, and you can get all of them for just $25 by using the coupon code House of Ed Tech, no spaces. Sign up now to access the courses for professional development on your own schedule. And thank you, SummerPD, for your support. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech podcast. I am your host, Christopher Nessie, and the House of Ed Tech explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. My objectives include discussing technology that is changing our classrooms and schools and sharing tools and tips that you can hear about today and use tomorrow. I talk to teachers, leaders, and creators just like you and have them share their stories. The purpose? Whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way we teach and how our students learn. So I may not be who you were expecting. For those that don't recognize me, I'm Caitlin, Chris's wife. I've been on a few previous episodes, but this time around I'm at the controls because Chris is under the weather. I'm looking forward to a great episode, and if you want to connect with me going forward, you can check out my website, katenessie.com, and I'm also on Twitter as at Kate Nessie. Coming up in this episode, I'll share an EdTech recommendation. I'll be sharing a great resource for images for you and your students, the latest house of EdTech VIP, and a conversation with Lynn Smargis, who spoke with Chris about coding in the elementary classroom. This is Can't Miss Content, as a Computer Science Week and the Hour of Code for 2016 are here. First, Chris got some feedback on the last episode, number 74, from a friend of the podcast, Derek Larson, via Voxer. Hey, this is Derek Larson with Southwest Educational Development Center, a regional service center in Southwest Utah. Hey, I want to let you all know, uh, Chris, I think episode uh, episode number 74 was amazing. It was one of the most powerful episodes I've ever had. I've ever heard you got, you produce. Uh, what an amazing topic. Women in STEM is huge. And I'm so grateful that you were able to introduce those three wonderful ladies and let them tell their stories as well as share what they are currently doing to help make it so that there are more women who are interested and willing to go into ed and to STEM. Uh, into the STEM fields. It's so important that we have all the different voices and then what we're doing. Otherwise, you get products that just don't make sense. They don't they don't work and that they're single-sided. So thanks so much for bringing them on the show. And thanks so much for tackling an issue that is, that is a large issue. I look forward to hearing more of these kind of shows in the future, Chris. Love the show, and I'm so grateful for it. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much, Derek. Chris really appreciates you taking time to share your feedback. And if you have thoughts on this episode or any other episode, go to chrisnessie.com slash feedback to share any time. And now, the EdTech Recommendation. This episode's recommendation is unsplash.com. All photos published on Unsplash are licensed under Creative Commons Zero, which means you can copy, modify, distribute, and use the photos for free, including commercial purposes, without asking for permission from or providing attribution to the photographer or Unsplash. This is a superior alternative to just Googling images for students who are designing anything that involves images. You and your students can use these great images for anything you can imagine. So check out Unsplash. That's U-N-S-P-L-A-S-H dot com today. So with Chris on the shelf with our elf pepper, I'm excited to lead you into his conversation with Lynn Smargis. She's going to share some great tips and resources for getting elementary students coding. Even if you're not an elementary teacher, get your pen or pencil ready. Here's Chris and Lynn. (laughs) 
And joining me here on the podcast tonight via Zencaster, I'd like to welcome to the House of EdTech, Miss Lynn Smargis. Lynn is an EdTech junkie with over 10 years of experience in teaching science in grades K through 9, and she is a multiple grant recipient. She currently teaches technology via coding, and she's also a technology coach at McPolin Elementary School in Park City, Utah, where she supports teachers in the classroom and again teaches coding in grades K through 4. She has spoken at multiple ed tech and regular educational conferences throughout Utah. She enjoys writing and blogging about the current hot educational topics in technology implementation in the classroom and on her websites. She serves on the district voice committee for her school district and has recently been invited as an EdCamp Utah moderator and a Nearpod pioneer. She is currently in the process of writing a series of EdTech books entitled This Is How You Do It, EdTech Inc. And she's a teacherpreneur who currently owns two businesses. One is called Academic Success and her most recent startup, Teacher Techology, an online educational resource for teachers. Lynn, welcome to the House of EdTech. Thanks, Chris. I am so excited to be here today. I am very excited, too. And I said that before we hit record. <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm more excited. You, you did seem pretty excited. And that gets me excited to talk to you, which I already <laughs> was. So we're going to have a good time. Sounds awesome. You threw something at me right before we started recording. So I'm going to throw it right back at you, which is kind of funny. <laughs> so you were talking about something called you could say the name, but it is a hackable, codable, programmable Frisbee. Yeah. Please share this story. <laughs> okay. So one of my coworkers, Crystal, so there are there are five ed techs um, for elementary school in our school district. We have a very small school district. And one of my um, elementary ed techs, Crystal, sent me over this um, link today, an email. And um, so apparently this Utah mom, um, her daughter wanted, wanted to know about coding and she didn't have coding class at her school. So the mom started doing a lot of research and um, they, they were doing Minecraft and some other different coding programs. And then she found out about Raspberry Pi, which is basically like a tiny little computer board. And then they learned how to program the Raspberry Pi, but she didn't find something that like her nine-year-old daughter would be able to like manipulate and use and code, but not be too hard for like a child that age, but because all the stuff that she was finding was apparently either really dumbed down or super like, like super high, like like high level thinking that was too hard for a nine year old to do. And so she developed this um, uh, Frisbee. It's called a Zuby flyer, Z U B I. And you keep, you build the flyer. So it comes in this little package. You can build it, put it together, the pieces, and then you can um, hack into it. So you can like program it and then you can play games on it. Like there's a variety of games you can play. And then you can also use it as a Frisbee, which I think is like in a great invention. And so if you're interested in looking it up, it's called Fuse. Her company's called a Fuse. It's F U Z E. I think it's fuseplay.com. And um, they are taking pre orders for shipments in January. And that looks like, I think I want to get one just to play with it myself. People need to go in and I just double checked it while you were talking. It is fuseplay.io. So that's F-U-Z-E-P-L-A-Y dot I-O. And that's where people can get the Zuby flyer. Yep. I'm going to get one of these. I'm going to get one. I, I want to play with it. I, that looks fun. And I'm an adult. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm no kid. I'm an adult too. I, I run a podcast. <laughs> um, so that actually is a great way to break into why you're here on the podcast, because you teach coding. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that coding is very important. You know, we, we talk about getting females involved in STEM, and re really coding is for everybody. And that's really the whole initiative of, you know, Hour of Code and, and really getting kids involved in this. Yes. But I think at the elementary level, that's very unique. And even what you just described about the Frisbee, sometimes that could be challenging to find something that's appropriate for the younger kid sorry, the younger student to get involved in coding. Right. So let's talk about coding in elementary schools. What are the benefits? 
I this is the first time I've ever taught elementary school. I've mostly taught um, middle and high, and so I'm used to the kids who are who can already read and and already like do like basic math computational problems. Um, the, but the thing that I see with coding, especially in the elementary kids, is um, the computational thinking. Like you don't get that, and you get that in math, and you get that in science, but you really have to dig into the process of computational thinking with coding and also decomposing um, your problems. So for example, like if you get, if you were doing all, all drop and drag, a lot of drop and drag um, coding with the kids. And so you usually, usually the coding programs go from like, you have a little character at one end and you have to get him to the puzzle or the end of the, whatever the, uh, the game is. And so you have to show him like directionally where to go or how to move or how many steps to move. And so it's really one of the really great benefits of coding that I love, I see all the time is that the kids really have to deconstruct construct their thinking. And so they have to say, okay, well, I'm here. Where do I want to go from here? I want to go there. And so how do I get there? And then if they, if they put their algorithm, which is their sequence of events together, and it doesn't end up on the other end, then I show them how to go back through it and say, okay, you started here. This is your first code line. Okay. Is that where you want to go? And then you have to break it down into each line of code, like as far as like their drop and drag blocks and see like what worked and what didn't work. And then we also go back through the process of like the students who have a harder time with it. I say, okay, drop, do your first two moves. And then they drop and drag their first two moves over. And then um, I had tell them, I say, hit play and see what happens. And then they, they move. And if it's, if they're going the right direction, I say, okay, now where's your next step? And so just breaking down that computational process and computational thinking for the elementary school kids it's, I think is like one of the biggest benefits because no matter what job you're in, computational thinking and problem solving is a huge um, skill to have in your toolbox for sure. Now, what are some of the ways that the elementary classroom that doesn't have coding can get started? If you were going to advise me or the people listening, how, how can we start doing this? Um, I think one of the ways to do it is to start with an age appropriate program or app. And the first thing you have to do is like see basically what you're comfortable using. And I think one of the biggest problems out there, and I know one of the biggest problems for me before I started teaching um, coding full time um, and I had a curriculum given to me is like I had no idea like what's out there, like what's easy to use, what's free, what's not free. And so I think um, the best thing to do is to find something that you're comfortable with, with coding. And it's something that's fairly easy to use. If you can, if you have a technology coach at your school that can help you work with that or train you on it before you implement it in the classroom, that I think would be a big plus because if you can have some training on it ahead of time, even if you just know how to basically use it. And a lot of, especially the elementary school kids um, and the, the coding apps and programs that are built for them are pretty easy to, to learn. So even if you don't have a lot of background in coding or science or um, computational thinking skills, um, it's pretty easy to pick it up. And so if, even if you just find an app you like and you bring it home and you play around with it a lot, um, you can usually figure out how to how to work that process. And so um, um, there's, a, there's when we get into the part where we talk about apps, I'll talk about like which ones are good for which grade levels. Well, before we talk about apps, and I know you are a super resource in this area because, hey, you're the expert, I'm not. Um, when you're getting teachers started and you talk about the benefits and you, you get them going from basically from scratch, no pun intended, <laughs> um, what are some of the ways that teachers can integrate coding into the other areas? Because I don't think this is about my listeners but I know that there are people who will say, I have to teach this in math or I have to teach, you know, writer's workshop. Right. How do they get, how can you get coding to fit in with what you're already bombarded with in terms of what you have to teach? So I know elementary school teachers, that's one of the biggest differences between elementary and middle and high school is like when you're in middle or high school, you usually have one or two subjects you teach. And in elementary, you have multiple subjects. Um, a lot of the coding programs that they have out there have, um, they usually have on the resource page, this, the math standards that it's tied to. So if you need to teach specific math standards, um, the first thing I would do would be to go on the app's resource page and find out what standards tie in with the ones you're already 
have to teach your students so that you're not having to do something extra per se. You're, it's more of like, okay, so these math standards for this coding program um, can apply towards my state curriculum standards for coding. Or you might have technology standards you have to teach your kids in class and pretty much any coding app is going to um, satisfy some of those technology standards that you need to teach. Um, and I know from my experience from being in three different school districts, there are a lot of, um, when you do your teacher review, when, you're, when your administration comes in and reviews you in the classroom, they always look for you using some type of like innovative technology. And so coding is a great way um, to check that off your list for sure. Now, I, I don't know if this would be considered an easy question or not, but I'm going to throw it out to you anyway. Go for it. You teach coding in your school. Yes. So does that kind of like a, bear with me. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> are, are you, is the coding class like a special, like the children go to art or music or phys ed? Correct. Yes. So in our school, we have, I think, six specialists. Um and I have the craziest schedule out of all of my colleagues in, in elementary school in my school district, but um, we have a six day rotation. And so, um, and we have, I can't remember how many classes, it's like 20 or something. And so uh, I go in during my time on the rotation for that grade level. And so when I go in, I have an hour with the students and I teach them, like I have just an hour to do coding with that class. And so what we generally do is we do whatever coding lesson I have for them for that day. And then at um, the end of class, about 15 minutes, minutes, we have these little journals, these little paper journals that they have. And they write, I give them a little sentence prompt, they write in that, like do a little reflection on what they did that day. And then they draw a picture. And some of the pictures are just so adorable and cute. Like it's really cute. One day this one kid drew a picture of me in my skirt with like the same colors and everything. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you're going in on this rotation, mm -hmm. there's time when you're not there. Are there teachers in some of the grade levels that are using coding above and beyond what you bring into the classroom? Actually, yes. So um, my one of my first grade teachers asked if she could use, we're doing um, Codable right now, which is an app on the iPad. And she asked if she, they, she could put that in her centers for the kids to do along with like iReady and some other programs they normally do in centers. And I was like, sure, absolutely. Because um, I don't get to see my first graders as much as I'd like to just because of our schedule. And so my first, I know one of my first grade teachers are definitely using it in centers. And so we're switching right now from Codables to Code.org. And so I'm going to be sending him a newsletter saying, hey, we're, you know, we just finished like a, some lessons on Codables. If your student wants to continue doing Codables at home, here's the code to get into the class, like the class code to get into Codables, and then they can work on it at home. That's fantastic. And I'm sure the students that you work with, they do get excited about this. Oh, it's, it's funny when they see me pushing the coding cart. Like one time I went into like the second grade class this past week. And as soon as they saw the cart, I heard everybody go, oh, like <laughs> <laughs> they get so excited at coding. They just, they really love it. I have very few kids who are not interested in coding, but I think like 95% of my kids get extremely excited um, about coding for a lot of different reasons, but it's definitely super engaging and fun. I, I agree that it, that it's fun. And I'm sure that maybe for that, K through fourth grader who maybe isn't a fan now, hopefully it comes back around. We call that spiraling in education. Yes. <laughs> hopefully it comes back around to them and, and maybe they get involved or get interested, you know, at some point before they graduate. Right. Grade. And I tell them, I'm like, you know, coding isn't for, and, and, you know, some people, some of the, the few kids that don't like it. And I tell them it's fine. You know, coding isn't for everyone. Like everybody doesn't like art. Everybody doesn't like music and that's okay. It's your personal preference, but, um, but they still, they still do the coding and they still seem to enjoy at least the process of it. And I think another thing the kids really enjoy with the coding is um, we do a lot of, um, I group kids by what level they're on. So I don't give them the solution. What I usually do is we'll start them off and I'll, I'll help them out, especially with the, the group that's not quite getting the concept of whatever coding program that we're doing. And then I'll take that group aside. And so um, I'll have like the key some, and then the other kids will be working amongst themselves. And then what I'll do is I'll group them by level. So I'm like, okay, who's on level five? You're going to sit at this table. Who's on level six? You're going to sit at this table. And so the kids do a, an amazing, like I'm really impressed how the, this younger group of kids can 
really work together to like solve problems in a group. Like I, I wasn't expecting this level of problem solving in groups because I mean, I'm used to it in middle school and I kind of expected the middle schoolers, but the elementary kids are very sweet about helping each other out. And they're really good about, um, one of the things we're going over is don't do like, they can't touch the other person's iPad and do it for them, but they have to explain to them what to do and and help them do it. So we talk about assisting the other person and not doing it for them so that when they get to the next level, they can do the next level on their own. So we do a lot of group work and group um, problem solving as well. Let, let me tell you, that is not an easy skill to pick up as many times when I work with a teacher, I have to put my hands behind my back uh-huh. <laughs> so, so I don't grab the mouse or, you know, do rather than teach. So. Right. Right. Yeah. I know when I coach, I have to, yeah, when I coach, I have to be really aware of that. Like I give people their computer and I'm like thinking in my head, don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. And then some people want you to touch it. And then I, then I can very easily say, no, no, you need to do it. So you learn. I I already know how to do it. (laughs) Yes. Because if they don't do it on their own, if they don't have that tactile experience, then they, it won't map in your brain. Like there's some, there's definitely a connection between having a tactile experience or writing or touching something and it imprinting in your brain. Exactly. Now you've been sneaky and you've dropped a couple of app names throughout the conversation and that's okay. There, there really are no rules here in the house. (laughs) But you did mention something that I do want to specifically ask you and you use the term coding cart. Now, Mm -hmm. what is that? What's on the coding cart and What's it all about? It sounds really cool. And all it is, is so in our school district, every ed tech coach has their own iPad cart with 30 iPads in it. And um, our school district is super fortunate because we are one-to-one from third grade up. And so third to fifth grade, they actually each are one-to-one with their own Mac. And then, but they can't take it home. They have to leave it at school and charge it. But sixth to 12th grade, they have their own Mac and they can take, they have to take it home and charge it overnight. Um, and they can't can't bring their charger to school with them. So they have to remember to charge it at night. And then when they bring it to school the next day, they have it with them all day so that they can utilize their computers in class with every teacher. And the district doesn't have to pay to charge them. That's genius. Yes. Yeah. And it, it's been working out really well. I think we've been one-to-one for like eight years now because I know I've lived here for – my kids have gone through the school system the past five years. And so um, that was actually one of the attractions of moving to Park City was this, the, um, the school district and the one-to-one. I really was like, wow, that's that's impressive. So No, that, that's really good. And the more – oh, the coding card is here reactions you can mm-hmm. get. You know, the, the better off you are. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because I've worked in school districts that um, my first one I worked in in Florida, um, we did not have anywhere near the technology resources. And so I literally got to use the computer lab twice a year for my um, seventh graders. And I was really kind of bummed about that because I really wanted to give them a lot more experiences with technology. And so um, and I wasn't able to do that. And so with with my position here in Park City School District, I'm really fortunate to have the tools that um, I need need um, to give that experience to the students. Getting the tools in the hands of our students, that is sometimes the true never-ending battle in education. Yes. <laughs> so again, so, so you've mentioned some apps, and here I'm going to try something a little verbally different. Today we're talking with Lynn Smargis. She is, again, from, from Utah, and she teaches coding. And now we're going to pick her brain about free coding apps and any recommendation that she has to get your elementary school students coding. So Lynn spotlights on, it's a little brighter now. <laughs> this is what people, this is what people tune in for. Absolutely. So it's what I what tune into your, your show for Chris. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you know how it works. So <laughs> what are some of your favorite and highly recommended apps that teachers can use and kids can learn coding from? Okay, so if you are looking for an app that is um, for K through two, or like you want to start out your K through two or K first, second grader, um, a couple of really good ones um, that are free are one is called Scratch Junior, and you've probably heard of that before. Um, there, it has a big brother called Scratch, and um, this was developed by MIT. Uh, it's group research based, so they have they actually took. Uh, for this one, they actually took kids and had them sit down and um, do the programming. The thing I like about Scratch Junior is it's really easy to use. Um, you only have it on the iPad, so the iPads are easier to manipulate for K through two than a regular computer is. Um, but the downside um, 
with oh so scratch junior basically is you have these little characters called sprites and then you can program them to do a lot of different things and so what one of our teachers did, um, has done at parley's park um, our two tech coaches over there kim and tracy they um, have made up like some lesson plans to go along with that so the great thing about scratch junior is it's really easy to program it's just drop and drag the um the the part of the objects you drop and drag are very visual so it's very clear to see like which object does what act like what event and then um but the problem is is you can't make classes up and so the student when they use that ipad for scratch junior has to come back to that same ipad because their previous project was saved on there so if you do scratch junior you have to have an ipad cart that has numbers on the ipads so that the kids know which number ipad they used the last time and as a teacher i would definitely suggest you write down the number of the iPad next to their name because there's always one or two kids that forget which one is theirs and then they won't be able to find their project. So Scratch Junior is definitely a really good one. Um, it's free and you use it on the iPad and I would definitely suggest that for K through second grade. Um, there's another one that I've been using lately which I really like. It's called Codable. It's K-O-D-A-B-L-E. Um, this one is a K through um, you could definitely use this for K, but I've been using it um, first through third grade. The third graders, it's pretty easy for, but um, you have this little character. It's super cute. The kids love the character in this one. It's called the Fuzz. And so you have to, so there's a whole story to it where um, the Fuzz has a spaceship and it crash lands and he can't roll on the grass. He has to roll on these little tiles. And so your job is to drop and drag the arrows over so that your Fuzz gets from the beginning to the end. And it goes through several different um, concepts for coding for this one. It goes through sequencing and algorithm and loops and obviously computational thinking. Um, and I think it also goes through events at the very end. And so the cool thing with Codable um, is you can create classrooms. And um, so what you do is you create your classroom with you input your Excel list. So I have all of my classes on there. And so for instance, if you are a student that's in three red, which is third grade red group, so you would, um, <laughs> Uh, click on your class group and then you click on your spaceship that says three red and then you find your name, you click on it and then it picks up wherever you left off. So it's really easy to use. It's very user friendly. Um, the the back end on the teacher end is super user friendly to use um, and you can create accounts. So you can do, there's 165 lessons and you can do 40 of these for free. And so some of my kids in three or four lessons have gotten through all 40 lessons, which is which was pretty amazing. Um, but I really like that one. That one's really Really fun and easy to use and you can create classrooms and then they do have the option where if you want to purchase it you can email them for a price on like how many accounts you like student accounts you like to have um and then another one um, that I really like for younger kids, too, is called Lightbot. Um, this one is block programming, and it has a cute little robot on it that you um, drop and drag um, commands to. And then you have to have it jump from one end to another and light up certain tiles and go around. Um, this one is definitely start a second or third grade and up. And so you could even play this with fourth graders. Um, I think they might get through it a little fast, but I think it's really good for fourth graders as well. Um, and then another one I uh, want to mention that we're starting to, we've been using in our school district since last year is called code.org. And so code.org, the thing I like about it is it's free. Um, this one is, um, this one, another thing I like about code.org is it has um, lesson plans for every, it has course one, course two, and course three. And I believe it has a course four and course five as well. But for our purposes right now, we're using course one and course two, because um, this is our second year in coding in Park City School District. So um, code.org, one of the things I like about it is you can create classes. So the kids go in, they click on their class link, they, um, and then and they have their own account. And so they like, just like Codable, they can go and um, pick up where they left off. But the one biggest asset that code.org has is it has lesson plans. So like for course one, you go through the different like parts of course one and they have some unplugged lessons, which are um, computer lessons on paper, which teach them about the different um, concepts that they'll be learning. So if you have loops, they have a loops lesson on paper and then you do the loops activity online. So I like this one because it really delves in into like getting the students to learn the concepts on paper and then also practicing them on um, 
their computer on their account. So um, code.org is a really great resource. And another thing I like about code.org and Codables both is that you can monitor the student progress. So you can go in, you can see who's doing well, who's falling a little bit behind, like who's kind of in the middle of the middle of the group. So I like both of those because they have really easy monitoring progresses that you can easily see. So um, for programming, those are some suggestions that I have used and I really like. Um, another one that I haven't really looked at a lot yet, but looks really interesting is the new Apple uh, program. It's called Swift. And one of the neat things about Swift is you can have students um, Oh, you, your students definitely have to be able to read because this is definitely a middle school or higher um, program. And so I have not used this with my elementary school kids, but um, I like this a lot. I've been playing around with it a little bit. Um, do you have playgrounds? And then so your playground, you add levels to which program you want to use. And so um, I think if you're a middle school teacher, I would definitely check out Swift because it's free and um, they have levels where you can start your kids out of. But I haven't really looked into it, but that one looks like a really great resource, especially if you are a middle school um, teacher and you're looking to program as well. That's awesome. You have shared so many awesome resources. No wonder the kids make exciting noises when you come to the classroom. <laughs> Well, they have. I haven't shared all of these with them yet, so um, they're, but they're getting there. They're they're really excited about Hour of Code, and um, my I'm doing the Hour of Code on Code.org, the um, Star Wars version with my I think it's my third graders. We're going to do that with this year, um, and so they're they're super excited about doing that. Oh, they will love that. Yeah. Let me take some time to thank you for taking time to come on the podcast here. It's been great to talk with you. We've, we've interacted on Twitter and we have, I believe Derek Larson to thank for that. Yes. I think Derek had originally invited you on Twitter cause I saw him on there. And, um, I think I had tweeted you the one night you were on you Ted chat and I was like, Hey, when you coming on, when you, when are you going to stay up late and come on you Ted chat with us? And then you popped on and I was like, there's Chris Nessie. Sometimes you catch me at the right time. I totally caught you at the right time. For everybody who has enjoyed learning from you here today, how can they connect with you? How can they pick your brain? What, what do you allow them to do to reach out? So if you'd like to reach out to me, there's a couple ways to do it. One is you can connect with me on Twitter. And my Twitter that I um, you can connect with me at is at Lynn Smargis. So it's L-Y-N-N-S-M. A-R-G-I-S. Definitely connect with me on Twitter. Um, you can also connect with me if you go to the teachertechnology.com website. There's a contact page on the end. So click on that contact page and fill out the form and you can connect with me that way as well. I would also love if you have an idea that you'd love me to put on my blog or if you would like to write something to, for me to put on my blog that you've done in the classroom, I would also love that too to share with other teachers and I can post that on my blog um, so that other teachers can benefit from your experience as well. Absolutely. Each one, teach one. Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lynn. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate the opportunity to be on your show. This was a lot of fun. Lynn shared some great resources on coding. If you try or already use the one she's mentioned, be sure to let Chris know on the show notes page for this episode, chrisnessy.com slash 75. And now let's get to the episode's House of EdTech VIP. Congratulations to Kathy Kurznowski. Kathy is a tech integration specialist, EdTech blogger, presenter, and soon-to-be admin from New Jersey. New Jersey in the house. She is an MIE trainer and expert. As a supporter of the Maker Movement, she also supports STEAM in her school and classroom. She's a regular at many New Jersey coffee EDUs, too. You can connect with Kathy as Kersey on Twitter at K-E-R-S-Z-I or check out her blog at K-E-R-S-C-I dot WordPress dot com. Congratulations, Kathy. You're our House of Ed Tech VIP. That's going to do it for this episode of the House of Ed Tech. Thank you again to Summer PD for supporting this episode. Remember to use the promo code House of Ed Tech to save money on your anytime, anywhere professional development. Keep the conversation going and visit Chris's website, chrisnessy.com slash 75. For the show notes for this episode, that will contain all the links and information shared today. 
And thank you again, Lynn Smargis. Chris would love to connect with you and hear your thoughts on information and resources shared in this and every episode. You can just go to chrisnessie.com and click share feedback. That will give you Chris's email and all the ways to connect with him. The fastest of which, which I know personally, is Mr. Nessie and the use of House of EdTech on Twitter. If you enjoyed the House of EdTech, do Chris two favors. Tell somebody about the podcast. Word of mouth is the best way to share great podcasts you love. And the second thing you can do is rate and review the podcast on iTunes. Your rating and honest review will help keep the House of Ed Tech front and center for others to discover and enjoy. Brent Catlett, co-host of Dads and Ed podcast, left his latest iTunes review. Chris Nessie does a tremendous job creating content in the House of Ed Tech podcast. His interviews are always relevant and timely for what is happening in the Ed Tech world. Tune in. You're missing out if you don't. You can also show your support through Patreon.com. Go to ChrisNessie.com slash awesome. Chris would like to thank his awesome supporters, and I would as well. Jen Giffen, Peggy George, Mark Grendel, Dan Gallagher, and Jeff Herb. The next episode of House of Ed Tech, number 76, will be released on December 18th, 2016, and I'm hoping that Chris will feel much better. It's time for the House of Ed Tech 2016 Smackdown, which I might be back for. Until next time, thanks for joining me, and remember, using technology isn't difficult. Just give it a try. House of Ed Tech is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. The Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators. Podcasts by educators. For more, go to edupodcastnetwork.com.